Thanks, Molly. Um, so as Molly mentioned, I'm Mike Bullen. I'll be your MC for the night. I'm not the new Tom, because those are very big shoes to fill. Um, but these are always fun. Another month, another all night. It's great to be back here at 60 AI. Um, and here's our agenda. So like I said, our theme for the night is the AR Cloud. Um, and I won't go through all of these names. We'll kind of do kind of introductions as they each come up. Um, but, but a really solid lineup of speakers. Uh, but before we get into these gentlemen, um, we thought it would be a good idea if I give sort of a you know, market recap or just a quick kind of snapshot of some of the things, some of the trends we're tracking at our and intelligence to kind of set the stage uh, for these guys. So um, I've titled this kind of Where Are We Now? Um, and at Artillery Intelligence, we do a lot of market sizing. Twice per year, we do a rather large market sizing exercise, um, and that includes just kind of the entire spatial computing spectrum. It's VR, AR, enterprise, consumer, hardware, software. What we're looking at here is one of those slices, which is essentially um, all the moving parts within AR, growing to 45 billion by 2022, uh, now at about just over 5 billion by the end of this year. Um, and what we want to do though is kind of provide a little more color for what goes into that by asking the question kind of where are we now and where are we going? So how many of you are tired of seeing this slide? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's actually, I don't want to, you know, slam another analyst for them. This is from Gartner. This is their, um, their hype cycle. I um, mean, it's actually perfectly valid. Uh, I just think it's kind of overused. Um, and I've been trying to think of um, kind of the market and these market dynamics um, in, in kind of different terms. So I've been coming up with a slightly different kind of construct and metaphor, which is a pendulum. So what we often see in emerging tech sectors, this isn't always the case, but we sometimes see this, where there is this kind of pendulum effect where in early stages, you know, the pendulum swings and there is, you know, this kind of market dynamic that is defined by, you know, supply side saturation and overblown expectations and lots of funding, sometimes you could argue too much funding. And then what happens is there's sort of a backlash to that and things kind of swing in the other direction as sort of a market correction. Um, so that's kind of usually defined by somewhat of a shakeout. You see companies running out of money and failing to secure follow-on rounds of financing. You see kind of a sobering realization across the space that the kind of technology, the underlying technology isn't as advanced as maybe we had thought or Consumers aren't picking it up as quickly as we thought. Um, so then what happens is the market kind of slowly moves towards um, a kind of happy medium um, that more accurately reflects the, the kind of marketplace realities. Um, and, and that is, you know, more kind of supply demand balance. And then things start to just kind of grow in a moderate but healthy way from there where kind of the supply and demand grow kind of in, in step. And, you know, just like the, you know, gravitational of the Earth, or gravitational pull of the Earth, excuse me, pulls the pendulum, like, towards that center point, these market dynamics and market forces kind of pull things towards that supply-demand equilibrium. And one kind of example of this that we've seen in the past that some of us probably lived through was the early 2000s dot-com uh, bubble, where you had that kind of, you know, oscillation, pendulum swing, lots of excitement, um, and then it kind of backlashed in the other direction where there was a recessionary period and, uh, you know, a shakeout. But then after that, you know, starting around 2002, things started to kind of slowly move towards healthy growth. Um, you saw companies kind of emerge from the ashes of that period that were called Google and Facebook. And then you just saw like a lot of healthy growth and kind of moving into movements like Web 2.0 in the 2005 or 2006 period. So the point of all that is it doesn't exactly match where we are now, but there are certain parts of that that are analogous <laughs> to what we see in this kind of progression of, of AR and this pendulum swinging. And that begs the question of where we are now. Um, I believe the, the worst is behind us. We're in that kind of like 2002 period of moving back towards uh, kind of moderate uh, but measured and healthy kind of industry growth. And there's, of course, a, a lot that goes into that. So uh, what's some of the evidence that we are indeed moving in that direction and, and is kind of behind us. So we do a lot of survey data. Um, the most recent wave shows that um, consumer mobile AR usage is up to 22% of, of U.S. adults. 
um, up from 17% the year before. Um, but more so, they are um, using it very frequently. So we asked them about frequency, um, which is an important metric, especially with anything related to mobile. Um, and 76% of the AR, mobile AR users are active monthly or greater. Um, and that really indexes well compared to a lot of other consumer technologies. Um, they all, they're also very satisfied. So we asked them you know, to rank their level of satisfaction with their AR experiences. Um, and 78% are satisfied or highly satisfied. Again, that index is very high compared to a lot of other consumer technologies. If you look at the addressable market, uh, the number that's thrown around a lot is a billion AR compatible devices. And that is accurate when we're looking at just AR core and AR kit. But it's a lot more nuanced. And we decided recently to flesh this out a little further because there are a lot of platforms, of course. There's Facebook Spark AR, there's um, Snapchat Lens Studio, there's Web AR, um, and there are all these kind of developing channels, the visual search through Google Search and other things like that. So, um, so, but the most important number is active users. So when you look at all of those channels, the du deduplicated number of active users is just under 300 million, um, and we actually see that growing. Um, if you look out to 2023, to uh, just under uh, 900 million users active uh, with AR. Um, and a, another few kind of supporting points or evidence points that I'll kind of wind down with is that Facebook has recently announced that it has served a billion lens views, AR lens views, in the last year, and that's between Newsfeed, Portal, and Messenger. The sleeping giant there is, is Instagram, um, and they've announced that they're going to open up their, um, their beta for uh, lens, sorry, Spark AR on Instagram uh, sometime this summer. We believe there's a strong product market fit there for AR and Instagram, and Facebook's also highly motivated to uh, find more kind of AR ad inventory outside of the news feed. Uh, Snapchat, similarly, reporting strong numbers, 130 million daily active users are using um, AR lenses, Snapchat lenses, 400 million community lenses created in the last year, um, which were viewed in total uh, 15 billion times. Uh, and Google Lens, uh, they've announced, they announced at their I.O. event that uh, Google Lens has had 1 billion AR activations, or lens activations, I should say, in the last year. This is one we're really bullish on because of its true utility um, and its propensity to be a, uh, like an all-day use case, as I like to call it. Um, the, the potential for high-frequency use as a tool and the utility throughout your day, kind of like searches, um, is something that I think is, is, shows strong signals for being a kind of killer app for AR. Um, and Google so far has really kind of rolled that out slowly and it's been harder to find. But one of the key themes at I.O. was that it's integrating it in more kind of high traffic places throughout search, throughout the search flow, and in different places. So as they continue to do that, I really am, am bullish on what Google Lens is going to do. And I would say in the same breath, not just Google Lens, but other tools like we're going to hear later from Justin with um, VPS, and navigation and having AR be a key component to that like UI, um, I think is going to be something that, that shows a lot of strength and utility. Um, and you know, beyond that, the use cases continue to expand. So when you talk about Google Lens and pointing your phone at something to contextualize it, you know, we're seeing things like inanimate objects and then things that are like style items and, and commerce oriented. Here's a great example of how Google is kind of tapping into its knowledge graph to bring in information such as contextualizing uh, restaurant menus. Um, and I think that those are going to continue to grow in terms of the use cases that are, that are valuable for everyone. And the reason I also mentioned Google is to bring it back to our theme of the AR cloud. Um, and Google, of course, created a tremendous amount of value starting 20 years ago by essentially being the organizational layer for the web, and that manifested in the, the search index. Um, and the way we view um, the AR cloud is essentially that same organizational layer, uh, but for the spatial web, and, and, and similarly bringing that amount of value in terms of just unlocking capability by having things indexed in the real world and having you know, the, the apps in the app layer that come along be able to do their thing because that space has been Index, uh, index is probably the wrong word, but you know the the organization um, and then parsing of, of, of the physical space having uh, previously been mapped um, and all the information that that brings with it. Um, so the companies building this, um, I think, are well positioned, and then one of them we're going to hear from next, and we're here in, in their location, of course, 60 AI. So I think what I'll do now is pass the torch over to um, to Matt and. Um, Please be join me in welcoming Matt.
ago, a few weeks ago, I'm not sure, but in half the time. So I want to quickly skim through and then leave you know, five minutes or so at the end for questions. So, um, you know, there were a bunch of questions at AWE that I didn't get to cover and figured it should uh, raise uh, you know, points of conversation. So since this is a night talking about the AI cloud, I will start by saying um, I don't really care that much about it anymore. Um, not that I care about the concept, it's really important. Um, you know, I helped to define it. It's still going to be like the fundamental, you know, most important thing that I think we build. But um, when you talk to customers, you know, do you want to buy an AR cloud? They don't really care. When you talk to developers, you know, do they want to develop an AR cloud? They don't really care. Um, they don't really care about AR that much. They just really want, um, you know, users, their users to have a great experience and they don't care really what, you know, how that's delivered. So it's sort of been a lesson that we've learned, you know, at 6D over the last sort of six months or so is that um, although we're, you know, completely convinced that this idea around the AI cloud is a powerful idea, when it gets down to like what do, you know, developers actually need, they need, you know, APIs that are going to help them, you know, build apps that solve problems for people. So when, um, you know, when people talk about the next platform, like AR being the next platform, really what we're talking about is, is the APIs, the interfaces that an app calls to access services. Now that used to mean um, you know, APIs to get to the hardware or the GUI you know, on, your, on your phone or on your PC. Then the web came along and those APIs started to become you know, how do you access the cloud, how do you access something like Amazon Web Services. And, AWS started to effectively become like an operating system for the web. And we're seeing the same thing. As we get into you know, this big umbrella of special computing, our apps need to be able to access stuff that's in the real world. You know, they need to live outside the phone. And so somebody, probably not one company, but like a range of companies are going to need to be building these APIs that you know, let applications access the real world. And I'll explain a little bit more specifically what that means about you know, the real world. Um, what makes this exciting to me is like I, I worked through the, uh, the dial-up networking company that made infrastructure to help get people from offline to online. And, you know, the broadband rollout. I worked for a company that invented the mobile phone web browser, helped get phones from offline to online. And we're going through a similar wave now as we go from like this devices where our apps are inside the, inside the screen or behind the screen to now they're out in the world. And the big difference that I've seen is that in the, you know, with the first wave of the internet, the first wave of mobile and smartphones, there wasn't anywhere near the same level of investment in this space before these products started to work. You know, obviously when after the iPhone started to succeed, everybody piled in. But we've had you know, tens of billions of dollars spent you know, each by the major platforms building out you know, AR and VR um, in order to make this work. So it's quite unprecedented, at least in my experience. So I've got a lot of confidence that this is going to play out. What's different about this experience now is that the requirements for an operating system have changed. It used to be the operating system just ran on your phone or ran on your PC. Then it ran in the web and it was kind of separate, you just sort of send these messages up to the web. But in order to do spatial computing, you're going to need this APIs that some of them are going to run locally on the device because the interfaces need to be real time, it needs to respond you know, to your sensors, it needs to fool your sensors. But at the same time, to get it to work, you, know, you really need this one to one scale map of the world. You need, you know, to be able to share experiences between devices in real time. And so a big part of it also has to live in the cloud. So it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a hybrid, um, you know, hybrid operating system that we're, we're all going to have to figure out how to build. Now as we build it out, there's, there's always been this um, tension between should you build a product first and make the product successful and then open up the APIs, something like what Facebook did with the news feed and then Newspeak got popular and then they opened up for their you know, login APIs and authentication APIs. Or do you build a platform, you know, something to commoditize and, and simplify some of the problem that people have already had? And AWS was a perfect example of that when everyone was trying to build their own websites. And I've tried both approaches in different companies. I've tried to build, you know, full stack AR from, you know, the, the algorithms right through to the applications and user experience. 
And I've also just tried to build you know, SDKs and sort of throw them over the fence and hope someone figures out what to do with it. But you know, what I've learned is that we really need a different approach now. And it's somewhere that you try and work hand in hand with the customer. Um, we need to find this combination of technology that works, that's really hard to do. You need to find a use case that you know, at least makes one person's life really better. But you also need to have a market for that use case. And nearly every AR startup and really most products from larger companies as well are lucky to get two of those, you know, if not three. So it, um, it really takes a fair bit of work and a lot of you know, iterating and it's why you know, A60 is the way it is. You know, we have a very strong research group out of, you know, here in San Francisco as well as in Oxford, as well as um, very strong like, product and commercial team that works closely with the customers to get those iterations you know, moving fast. And what's, um, what's interesting is you get, I get asked all the time, like, what's the killer app? What's, what's the killer app for AR? And the um, thing is, the use cases are the same use cases like, that have been there for 10 years. It's, it, it's not, you don't need to sort of have some amazing insight to sort of go, oh, this is a good idea you know, for AR. Just ask anyone who's been around for five years or so. It's all the same stuff, but the user experience has never been good enough. And so what you know what we've been trying to solve and we've seen the other big companies try and solve is how do we just get this user experience simple enough? And then how do we find, you know, at each of these, you know, this is a, a bunch of sort of reasonably obvious use cases, how do we find a customer for each of those? And you know, in our case, you know, we can't announce any of those, but we've got at least one in each of those verticals that we're working with. Um, the Apex Twin logo. Should be on top of entertainment. That's sort of one that, that is public. We've done some stuff with that, and um, yeah, there's more coming that we'll be able to talk about later in the year. But so when I, when I talk about these APIs, although what specifically does that mean? And interestingly, that the bottom that everything you know, hangs on is we need to be able to have a, a shared and persistent set of coordinates that our devices all understand. And the way, you know, what that's called when you, you know, hold your phone up and your phone kind of figures out where it is and synchronizes itself in space, that's called globalization. And that's a hard, it's an easy problem to solve in a trivial way, but it's a hard problem to solve in like a global way. So that's something that we're, you know, continuing to work on, you know, and we'll keep working on. Once you get your coordinates and you know where you are, then you need some geometry, you kind of need to know the structure of the world. You may not know what anything is, but at least you know there's a solid thing there and a solid floor underneath you, and there's a big blobby thing over there that you know my app can't you know, interact with. Um, then you start to move up into you know semantics, and you have APIs that will start to tell you what things are, both what they look like, maybe some color and some textures and things, you maybe some segmentation, like splitting things. So I know that you know this blob is a separate thing to this blob, and then start tracking what they are, so we know it's a chair, a person, a wall, or a floor, and then we move into a real-time understanding. And the real-time stuff is you know, where things get interesting because most of the work in AI today has been in the cloud. You know, it's like Google or Facebook with like a billion computers processing to recognize all our faces. But with AR, all this stuff is now moving down right to the edge on the device and these networks are running in real time to be able to track people and, and track your motion and recognize what things are you know, within one frame. And of course, so we need to do that you know, at high performance, um, so it runs on lots and lots of different phones, lots of different devices. We need scale, and by scale I mean getting beyond sort of tabletop AR experiences into like the whole world. And then um, reach, which is getting into all different sorts of authoring tools and all different types of form factors and devices. So you get, if you're wearing you know, a Magic Leap headset or a HoloLens headset or um, you know, you're holding up a phone or a tablet, you can all have that sort of shared experience to the potential you know, capabilities that that device can deliver. But the, the application should be you know, a shared experience across the board. So this is roughly our roadmap is a strong word, but this is the stuff that we're going to be working on and it's all you know, doable and achievable to you know, varying degrees of quality in the next 12 months. Um, so yeah, that's, that's specifically the APIs that go into building out this type of uh, real-world operating system. Um, so this is where you know, our job is uh, as a company. We're trying to tackle these um, really 
difficult technology problems and expose them to developers um, so that you, know, you can do what you want to do and we want to make you successful. Uh, so what are some of those problems? Um, 3D meshing, world scale, you know, crowdsourcing, your localization, segmentation, which is like the real time splitting things up and cross-platform privacy. And we've got some videos here and we can, you know, the team can show you demos of this stuff running. But this is all running on um, a regular iPhone, so there's no like depth camera or you know, special scanning, anything going on, it's just a, an iPhone. And walking around grabbing a sort of you know human readable 3D model of um, Anthony's apartment. And one of the um, problems when you do that is, you know, with, with either our system or, or you know, a depth camera is that often you, you miss a bit or you get bored or you get interrupted and you've got to come back later and somehow you need to sort of pick up where you left off without being you know, manually aligned like different chunks. And so this is um, how we do this with four different devices all at the same time. It could be like one person doing you know, a little bit each day and stitching them all together, but this is a new feature called Mesh Fusion that really starts to enable crowdsourcing of these meshes and you know, the SLAM model of the world. So it sort of runs around, I think it took three and a half minutes to capture this whole office um, for, with, with four different people. So it looks like this. Um, we don't yet know um, how many people this can support. We probably should try it with like 100 or 1,000 people and get some volunteers and just sort of see if we can very quickly mesh a large area. But this is sort of brand new for us in the last you know, week or two. So um, gives a little walkthrough of how it works. And obviously, you know, on our side, this will work whether you've got a new iPhone, an old iPhone, an Android phone, some sort of headset, it won't matter. And you end up with a nice sort of you know, human readable model. It's not not intended to be used for like marketing assets, but in terms of being able to extract data about the space, if you wanted to author an AR experience in this office, you could just take that model and lay out your virtual content from your desk, and the content would, because the coordinates are consistent, the content would appear in this office exactly where you put it. So um, this is important both for you know, capturing large areas as well as like if you want to create an AR experience for say a museum and you don't want to have to actually go to the museum and like drop the content here and walk around but you say look here's the app people in the museum on the other side of the world run around and do a scan you call up the next day and say hey you missed this room in that room go back and do it again and very quickly you have this model and then you as the author can then just you know put the signs on the statues put the animations and guide things and it'll all appear remotely you actually never even get to visit the museum so this is a pretty sort of big deal in terms of enabling talks for authors as well as um, all types of you know, AR experiences for you know, real estate and home insurance and all this type of stuff where you can go to regular phones now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this one, if it plays, this is what happens if you, like after you do the scan and you come back, you know, like a couple of days later and you want to do something in this office. So you fire up your app, you don't really do anything, you don't enter any special like, room numbers or anything. Um, you'll see it, you know, it downloads over there like a 30 meg um, file, so as quick as that downloads. And then it takes about three seconds um, to localize and you'll see that come in and we'll now have this, this session, you know, that an app could be running, all this could happen in the background. We now have like half the office loaded and as that, you know, as this person moves around the office, that'll just make that map you know, better and better and better. And so over months or years, that model will just be constantly refreshed and updated. So that's all really good for getting um, you know, rooms. You probably noticed there weren't really any people in those rooms. Um, and so we to move on. This one's a little video of um, people segmentation and enabling the occlusions of people in real time. And this was at Coachella, I don't know if that was April or something, and you know, just walking around and grabbing you know, outlines of people in the crowd. Um, this is pretty much similar to what Apple announced um, last week, a few weeks ago, with uh, WDC about their human segmentation. Uh, the difference with ours is that um, It'll run right down to like older iPhones, and when we launch Android, it will be cross-platform on Android and iOS. It will also um, 
you know, enable a lot of privacy features. So if you're scanning this space, you know, anything that's in red, we just don't even capture in the first place. So you don't need to like come back and blur faces out. The people never even get into the map in the first place. So it's a, um, and as well as that, simultaneously it will do the depth and the meshing of the room in real time. So it's, um, you know, yeah, it's a good, good feature to, uh, you know, let people build these large scale outdoor experiences in you know, crowded spaces. And obviously this is, this is sort of seven or eight months old code for us. It's got a fair bit better since then with, with what we launch. So, um, yeah, a whole bunch of reasons uh, why this is, this is good. It helps you do a whole bunch of new features as well as makes the system itself work better. Um, it does raise some new ethical questions in that, you know, what happens when we can start removing people from your view as you see them. Um, that's great if you're trying to do an Instagram story at the Eiffel Tower and you want to get rid of the tourists. It's bad if you start saying, I just want to remove, you know, all of you guys from, because I don't want to look at you and just remove you from uh, what I see. So we're, uh, we're sort of having to, as a team, think through, like, how do we, how do we release these APIs uh, in ways that, you know, encourages good behavior. Um, so I'll quickly wrap up, like this is just a little bit about how we're positioned. Um, we're finding, as we talk to customers, that they want an independent cross-platform solution where the data is going to be managed in a pretty trustworthy way. Um, the, yeah, we're finding we're the only company that's sort of out there that can do this sort of stuff. And um, the bigger the customer, the more um, importantly they need to do this. And finish with a quote from Kevin Kelly about how big a deal this AI cloud thing that I don't care about is going to be. <laughs> but um, we just, yeah, you know, wanted to really try and bring this down to a practical level and get away from this sort of high concept um, way of being vision or something and talk a little bit about the specifics of what we're building and, and how that's going to come to market and be exposed and developers can take advantage of it. So uh, thank you. And yes, wrap up.
Uh, we can also do uh, occlusion, uh, and do physics, and um, real-world navigation, so the rabbit can find its way around the space. Um, the toy that you throw to it can bounce off of things. The, the words that you say, uh, the letters can bounce off things. And since we know where places that rabbits can hide are in space, uh, we can tell the rabbit to hide it over at the hide the tree or a table. Um, and the other nice thing is uh, the relocalization capabilities uh, uh, that allow multiplayer to work without having to have a marker or any other kind of syncing. Um, you just fire up the two devices, uh, and you both localize, and then you're in the same space looking at the same content. Um, and then the last thing is you can talk to your rabbit Battles back to you and give it commands that it understands. So that's that's sort of the app in a nutshell, and it is available. I think it might be installed on a couple of devices there that you can try out the presentation, or feel free to download it yourself from the App Store. And I want to talk a bit about how Battle Rider came to be. Uh, so it started life as a 60 demo guide challenge. And we were accepted into that, and we're one of the finalists. And uh, that one, uh, at the time, was called WYSIWYG. And uh, we were uh, again exploring this idea of being able to create things with your voice and have them appear. And one of them was a rabbit. And we're like, oh, let's uh, let's see if we can actually uh, wrap an actual app around uh, around the rabbit uh, experience itself. Uh, so with that said, we had some goals for the app, some design goals. Um, the, uh, the first was we wanted to make it extremely easy for uh, a player to get into the experience. Um, we also wanted to make it very fun and whimsical. Uh, we also wanted to take full advantage of the new occlusion and multiplayer capabilities that uh, were provided by 6D. And we also wanted to explore an alternative UX paradigm for AR, uh, namely voice control. Um, and, uh, you know, in doing that, we, we faced some challenges that uh, we wanted to talk about that we had to overcome. Uh, uh, the first one uh, was uh, the UI itself. Uh, so, you know, WYSIWYG uh, was a microphone-only app. It was a single button interface. Uh, you talked and created things with your voice. Uh, but you know, when it came to creating a pet rabbit, you know, we were trying to mimic a real-world interaction with an animal. So you know, there are things you would say to an animal, um, and then there are interactions that are mediated by physical objects, such as tossing a ball or tossing food. Um, and so for the latter, you know, we came to the conclusion that it made more sense to give those a physical representation. So if you want to throw a carrot, you tap the carrot button and flip the carrot into the space. Um, it just seemed a bit forced to make someone create uh, a physical object by speaking. Uh, once, uh, you know, what you see is what you get wasn't really the main focus of the app. Um, and another challenge uh, that we had was um, just giving the permissions. So this is how the permissions looked uh, when we first uh, launched the first couple of releases of the app. You know, you have the camera, uh, you need to know your location, microphone and speech detection and they would just kind of all pop up at the beginning of the app uh, startup and um, we got some feedback that this was somewhat overwhelming for some people and also we just felt that it might be a barrier to some people continuing to use the app after initial downloads or sort of worldwide and you know, this stuff. So um, we looked in the app store, we couldn't find a, a nice component that allowed us to um, sort of ask nicely for permission, so we created our own, and uh, it's actually open source, and it looks a little bit like this. Um, you can skin it the way you want. If you go to our website, you can find the GitHub link. But, um, so it sort of steps you through one by one each of the permissions, and we thought this was a much nicer experience uh, for people. Um, and then the last uh, sort of uh, design challenge was the relocalization and meshing experience. So, as I said, we wanted to get people into the experience really quickly. Um, and so the, the thing to say about relocalization is it tends to work best if you encourage the user to make lateral movements back and forth with their device so that you can capture uh, the, the space well. Um, but then for meshing, you sort of want to have them walk around freely and roam around looking at the space. 
And uh, the challenge here was to create an experience that sort of uh, smoothly transitioned from one uh, uh, from localization into meshing and then into the experience. Uh, but we didn't want it to. We wanted it to be playful uh, rather than technical. So the first you know, crack at it, uh, we came up with the idea of having this little butterfly that we follow around in space. And the butterfly would just choose a random spot uh, to move to, and you would sort of follow it around. And the, the conceit was that you're following this butterfly around, and it's, it's leading you to the spot where your rabbit lives. Um, and we found that uh, one thing was is that it was sort of rather hard to follow this butterfly around and figure out where it was going. Um, and also, uh, it didn't always result in a good real localization uh, and or even a meshing experience sometimes. Um, so we did a couple iterations of that. We, had, we, we tried to make the movement of the butterfly a little uh, different, like go back and forth in front of you when you're relocalizing and then once you're relocalized, uh, you know, headed to, uh, you know, walk or zigzag uh, around space and around you so that you're sort of following it. Um, we found that this just took way too long. Uh, you know, it could take upwards of a couple minutes just to get to the point where you, you found your rabbit. Um, and uh, it also, it, it was a strange push and pull that you're, you know, that you're experiencing where, uh, like I said, the conceit is that you're following this uh, butterfly around, but in fact, uh, we were having the butterfly move relative to where you were looking. Um, and then, again, for the meshing experience, you want, the, you want that to be pretty much fully under the user's control where they, where they want to create their play space. So we finally uh, decided we needed to kind of go up one level in terms of abstraction. And we did a few experiments. Uh, the first one was this, uh, this collection uh, to get the lateral movement. You would collect these little paint balls, and then you would use those paint balls to paint the space, which was the meshing experience. And this, this actually worked reasonably well. Uh, the metaphor wasn't great, so, um, uh, because, uh, you know, it's a rabbit. So we thought, well, what, what's a rabbit thing you could do or in the universe of rabbits? And, and then we came up with this final experience, which looks like this. Uh, and I took this this morning, uh, just a single, uh, single take in my backyard, and so first, it starts with the seed collection experience. You've got these flying seeds that you're trying to catch, um, and you're filling up the rings to catch the seeds. Once you've caught all the seeds, then you're using them to plant clover. And you'll notice as I get to the patio there, you can see the clover. And then as soon as you've meshed enough, and uh, the, your rabbit appears. And uh, we, we found this to be a much nicer experience. Uh, and uh, so, what we found is that, uh, you know, we've instrumented the app and with our current onboarding process, uh, in most instances, a player can easily complete both localization and meshing in less than 30 seconds of total time. That's our goal. Um, and often much less than that. Um, so about 70% of the time happens within 30 seconds. Uh, and even my third grade, five or so percent of onboardings come in under 20 seconds. Um, the very quick ones that you see there that are like, less than 10 seconds, um, those are usually the ones that uh, uh, a, a successful relocalization happens. In that case, uh, we know where you are, we've already downloaded the mesh that you did previously, so we can speed up that uh, seed collection process and, and nearly almost skip the whole meshing process to get right into playing. Uh, uh, and then uh, just one last step, and this was uh, in, in the cases where people were able to successfully localize because they had previously uh, played in a space, um, we found that uh, most of those happened super quick. Um, so kudos to the CSB team for that. Um, and almost half, like about forty-seven percent, was less than two seconds from the time you started localizing to the time uh, uh, you knew where you were. And uh, actually, I think it was like around ninety-some percent uh, took less than ten seconds to figure out where you were. Um, now, the localization, we kind of cheat a little bit in the case of single player because the localization, while it helps uh, load the mesh that you've done previously, it's not strictly necessary uh, because, um, so we, you know, we wanted to get people in, so we kind of arbitrarily cut it off at 10 seconds and said if you haven't, better be localized by that time. But this, this slide is about successful localization. Um, but also, um, for multiplayer, it is it is critical because you need both players to be in the same space and you know that they're in the same space and they have a shared coordinate system. So in that case, uh, 
uh, if the relocalization, relocalization isn't successful, would we'll direct you to kind of move closer to the player that you're playing with and try it again until you get a successful relocalization. Um, so those are, those are kind of the things that I wanted to cover. And I'm happy to take any questions so you can, I guess, put my mic, put your microphone back on. Yeah, so Patrick, let me uh, get your audience. Let uh, me take get your face if you want to Learn more about us. You can go to our website, and if you want to download the app, it's right there. And uh, we'd love to get some tweets or photos of the app if you happen to download it. Oh wait, do people still want that? Everyone get it? Okay. Uh, Patrick, can you hear me? He can't. Oh yeah, I'm muted. <laughs> Turn my mic on. Hey, okay. Okay. Um, yes, I think you're done. Uh, good. So, um, so thank you. That that was a good um, tactical look at a lot of the ways to prompt the user behavior for relocalization. Um, so we actually don't have a lot of time for questions, and we need to move on to the next speaker. However, um, actually, let me get you screen share off. Um, so um, while I was uh, listening to that, I actually downloaded BattleRabbit and I'm on iOS. Uh, so I guess one question in closing is, where are you distributing and where can people find uh, your technology? Uh, we're distributing in the App Store. Mm -hmm. uh, we will eventually be in, uh, in the Google Play uh, as soon as uh, we get the AL Android version of 16, uh, which uh, is forthcoming. Okay. You'd have to ask Matt about buying on that, and he probably won't give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, any day. Yeah. But Jeff says any day now. Any day now, yeah. Um, so thank you. Um, please, everyone, join me in thanking Patrick. about some of the lessons we've learned over the process of the past few years, bringing AR to Google Maps. Uh, and when we were looking at Google thinking about what problem can AR solve, we thought about this problem. You come out of a subway station and you're trying to figure out which way to go. And it's often a little stressful, especially if you're in a new city or a new environment, or you're running late, and then your blue dot is doing this, right? <laughs> Uh, so this is problematic, this is not helpful, and how many of you have actually just started walking in a direction to then see what happens to your blue dot? Right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so we're like, all right, this is actually where AR can provide real user value to people. And so this is, spoiler alert, this is the current experience as it live on Pixel phones today. Uh, so we relocalize, we show you a, a small 2D version of the map to help you ground, ground you, and we have a, a relatively small number of AR elements in the camera view to show you the next direction and the next turn you're going to need to take, and then where your ultimate destination is. So, what's powering that? So, the reason why your blue dot is problematic in urban canyons is your GPS signals are actually bouncing multiple times off of all of the buildings. In that, uh, in that environment. And that's what's resulting in uh, your blue dot drifting around is because your GPS satellites are not actually geo, uh, geospatially locked. They're rapidly orbiting the planet, and so they actually move. So as you are standing still, those GPS satellites you're getting your positional tracking information from are actually tracking across the sky. So you have all this satellite uh, bouncing. So how do we solve that? Acronym soup. Uh, so it's Visual Positioning Service, otherwise known as VPS, plus AR Core, plus Street View imagery, plus Machine Learning. And so we combine all of those things to provide a good pose for your phone uh, based on the, that combination. So we first start out with all of our worldwide Street View imagery. So this is the basis from which we process, we process it, we extract the key visual features in that data, so things like the outlines of buildings, entrances to buildings, notable uh, statues and landmarks, etc. And then we apply VPS. And so we use VPS to basically extract from those images, because we have well-posed street view images, we can extract these points and then use them to compare against a query image from the phone to figure out where that phone is positioned, both position and orientation. 
But just using VPS to extract those visual features is not sufficient because of things like this. Trees. God bless trees. Uh, <laughs> but what we can do is use machine learning to then figure out what are the objects in the scene, what are the characteristics of scenes that we should ignore. And so these are things like trees, cars, trucks, construction equipment, people, so that we don't use those in our localizations. And that then results in being able to, we like using our GPS signals, but we don't trust them entirely. And so we use GPS as well as other on-device uh, localization signals in combination with VPS to help provide a weighted position, which then enables the experience of walking navigation in AR. So how do we design the experience? We saw the Battle Rabbit folks talk about some of the problems of relocalization. So there were a lot of challenges in coming up with that experience. Uh, we did over 120 iterations of UI prototypes, UN and UX prototypes. Here are a few. Uh, so I'm going to talk through a couple, couple of these things here. Um, the first one I have to talk about is the Fox. I think if folks uh, saw the Fox uh, a couple, what was it, one or two IOs ago, um, the idea that you would have this sort of lovable digital character that would walk around with you and show you which way you wanted to go. I recommend not doing this because these are incredibly compelling creatures. People want to watch them. They want to see where they're going and where they're going to do next. And, and I didn't see that street sign. I didn't see that other pedestrian. <laughs> Those are bad things. Uh, so uh, the Fox, will make, we hope, will make an appearance at some point in the future, but just not in the first iteration. Uh, then the question is, how do you localize? How do you get the person to look around? So actually, for one of our first, well, I think this is like prototype number 10 on this, is on the left-hand side. So we're just going to put objects and di floating digital objects that you then have to fill up with color, indicating that you've looked at them long enough, we've got enough imagery, and then have you pan around. The problem was people had no idea why, how this was connected to walking navigation. <laughs> I mean, if, if you like cyberpunk or other stuff, like, you're like, sweet, I'm in the Matrix, but that makes no sense for someone who's like, I just need to get to the donut shop. Uh, so on the right is what we do, is we say, hey, here's this very simplified version. Look around, and once we fade this out, well, it's much longer, than we start to show you these dots, right? And as you start to pan, once we get a lock, we do that nice visual pop. And we've actually seen that users start to intuit what kind of features are useful for localization purposes. And localization times actually start to decrease because users are not looking at this very beautiful but featureless white wall, which would be awful for relocalization, as opposed to a, you know, that wall with a bunch of stuff on it or the windows, etc. All right, so then we get into how do we do, indicate what path you're supposed to walk on. And so this one was, we were like, oh, well, because localization quality is going to vary. It's not a binary thing. Like, you're, you're not 100% localized or not localized. So you sometimes have error in your localization. So maybe we show a path of particles and the width of the path of the particles, like the, the yellow brick road, the, the better our localization confidence, the narrow it becomes. I'm like, this is great. And we had users say, hey, why am I following a path of trash? <laughs> so we moved on. Uh, and then we were saying, well, part of the problem we were having is people were not able to contextualize the 2D map with a 3D experience. And so then we started to experiment with showing a 2D representation of where you are and how you're moving around. And that started to get a lot of good feedback. Uh, and that transformed into this kind of experience, where we, we didn't actually having the floating disk was not as intuitive as just having this sort of thing here. And so as I rotate, this feels more grounded to the person's core. So uh, a couple of work in progress uh, principles to cover, discover, or to consider as you're designing world scale experiences. Uh, first one is focus on data quality. This is really important. Uh, cities have fairly structural, significant structural differences in terms of the type of layout. And depending on the layout of your city and your, uh, your space, you're going to need different characteristics for the kind of UI and experience that you design for those spaces. Uh, 
And then, like, depending on where your data is coming from, uh, if you do a driving model, that's not the same as a, a walking model. And like sometimes, like you may not actually know where the pedestrian crossway crosswalks are, and so you give people a very specific route, and that's not the right way to go. That can be really, really bad. <laughs> and, and in fact, we uh, we spent a lot of time in Google Maps trying to figure out, hey, where are the trails, and how do we do pedestrian underpasses and all this sort of stuff because we don't want people walking across the freeway. Uh, that's bad kind of news, just even in two D land. Uh, and so this is where uh, we sprinkle some machine learning on our Google imagery to then start to try to extract these key features when we're determining our walking path. Uh, the other thing is you really should embrace the sense of immediacy for AR. Uh, you know, it's very easy on a beautiful big screen like this to be like, I'm going to do this full AR experience and show me and show the user all of the key points of interest in that experience. The reality is they're looking through, I have to bring my phone up, they're looking through this tiny screen and you're going to overwhelm them with all of that information. Focus on what the user is immediately trying to accomplish and nothing more, like pair, pair, pair away. And like this kind of lesson for a lot of us was, a, it was a hard learning experience and our UX and UXR teach teams were, did a fantastic job of user studies, really trying to tease apart what's critical for the user when you're giving the navigation directions. All right, and you also need to make sure you're providing some grounding and glanceability for your experience. Because as much as we all love AR, our consumers are not AR first. They see AR as a means to an end. And so, you know, when you are glancing at your phone, how do you separate the AR elements from the real world? And so, we, th we did a bunch of studies where we're like, hey, maybe we should actually gray out the real world to make those digital elements pop. The problem is, is that that's a, that can be a heavy context switch for some people who don't then necessarily realize that the black and or this gray version of the world is the real world. And when you're designing UI and UX, make sure you're leveraging familiar elements. For maps, we have a long history of iconography that people recognize and have been using for a long period of time. And so we, what we realized is like, let's just use as much of that as possible so we minimize the cognitive load for any user getting into AR for the first time. Beware the blue line. If you show someone a blue line like this, you know what they're going to do? They're going to follow it. They're going to follow it, and they're going to actually, you know, like, they might run into this person, they might kind of just skip here. Unfortunately, we've got two crosswalks here, which isn't too bad. But if there's not a crosswalk, let's say there wasn't a crosswalk here, people will get upset. And, and, you, and people will have this sort of cognitive dissonance of like, the blue line is saying go this way. There shouldn't be a wall here. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is why as part of our experiences, you see sort of just floating arrows rather than like a very specific concrete route because we want people to actually be in the real world in AR and, and use AR in moments as opposed to being in this AR mode. Because a screen is very, very compelling. How many times have you seen someone driving, because you would never do this, seen someone driving and looking at their phone? How many times have you seen someone bicycling while staring at their phone? And how many people stare at their phones while they walk around? Like, this is not, this can be really dangerous, actually. And so we actually spent a lot of time iterating on how can we improve people's situational awareness? So it's like, hey, maybe at the start, we're just like, hey, warning, just glance at this, put it away. Uh, or maybe let's just turn off the screen <laughs> and stop, be safe. Uh, we ended up going for a, a, a space in, the, in between where we start to gray out the world a little bit. And we may have, we can give people a little uh, dramatic warnings in some cases, but be pleased, if you're building an AR experience, think about situational awareness. Uh, situational awareness is something like, you do not want this person looking at the phone while they're crossing the street. And, and user safety is really important. Uh, it's the sort of thing that if the wrong headline gets written, 
it's bad for everyone in the space. <laughs> and it's also, it is, it's also the right thing to do by your users. And to that end, also make sure you're trying to keep your error moments short and assistive. Uh, and because one of the things is, like for us, we've got Google Maps, right? There are actually a lot of situations in, when, in which AR is not actually helpful, it's more of a gimmick, and the 2D map is actually perfect to help users accomplish whatever they're trying to do in Google Maps. So think about your, when you're building something in AR and ask yourself, am I doing this because AR is actually the right tool to help the user, or do I have a hammer and now everything looks like a nail? So that's my talk. Thank you. actually work in real life. Very fascinating. We have a few, uh, uh, time for a few questions for Justin. Um, I can walk the mic to you or you can shout it. Gentlemen? I'll just shout it. Uh, you said you have various inputs that you're using for your localization and various weights that are happening there. How much of an influence has Bluetooth beacons played with that? Uh, so the question is, how much influence do Bluetooth beacons have for localization for air walking navigation? And the answer is relatively little. And part of the reason is we wanted to have air walking navigation work at global scale. And while Bluetooth beacons have had significant uh, value in certain specific locations, uh, given the relative lack of their global coverage and global installation, we haven't, we haven't heavily used them. Now, uh, that doesn't preclude us from using them in situations where we do have a good map of them, but actually, uh, the global positioning system plus localization on street view are primary uh, signals we tend to use. I guess as a follow up, how do you see that moving towards the future, especially for indoor areas? Uh, so the question is, how does that then approach for indoor? Uh, so one of the great things is that the technology BPS was actually developed in part initially for Tango and Tango phones, and we actually deployed a number of indoor locations. Uh, using Tango and, and the VPS technology. So we can localize. If we have a, a, a Google Street View backpack that goes through space, we can localize it off that imagery. Um, and so there's a, a bunch of other stuff related to indoor stuff. But actually, uh, if you want to talk about indoor localization, I, Eric, I have to give you a great grade for a moment. So uh, Eric in the back, who works for 60 Ag, he, he and I work together on Tango. Uh, so um, he, he works on uh, business development here at 60 Ag. So if you're thinking about building global scale stuff, uh, you should go talk to him. Um, Yes, of course. Uh, so the question is about the availability of this technology and APIs for UN apps. Uh, so we haven't publicly announced uh, an API, uh, launch date or availability for the APIs. Uh, come talk to me afterward and we can talk about more specifics. Other uh, questions? In the back. Does it feel like you're building something that should be, should be used for like uh, AR HMDs, but you're trying to like put like a square peg into a round hole through the smartphone because it's a it's a smartphone. It's not really meant to be uh, an yes, AR device. It's meant to be a phone. Yeah, this is a great question. So like, hey, are we trying to fit a square peg into a round hole because we actually are wanting to build for uh, AR HMDs? I would say no, because. Uh, we actually see a really, like, a, we get a lot of positive feedback from users, not necessarily when they're, tra they're in their own hometown, but when they travel. So the first time they go to a city, like, we've gotten numerous emails from folks who are like, hey, I just went to Detroit for the first time, and I use this every time I left the hotel. And you can think about people have, you know, people have either low familiarity with their environment or high familiarity with their environment. And then some people have high navigational confidence, and some people have low navigational confidence. And these are spectrums. And air walking navigation, for those folks who are not familiar with their environment and are, don't have particularly good uh, self-awareness of localization and positioning, this is incredibly valuable for them. And even on the phone form factor, it's very useful. Uh, Many people actually use Google Maps and they look at the walking navigation directions and they don't actually hit start direct, start navigating, um, just on 2D. They will look at the map and they will sort of internalize that mental model of where, what turns they need to take and they're good to go. 
they handle, obviously they don't like a lot of Zork back in the day. Anymore. So, uh, but that's the sort of thing, like some people are just really good at that internalized mental map, and they don't need it. But Google Maps is about bringing information and directions and navigation assistance to as many people as possible. And so this is also really helpful in situations where, say, you may not speak the language or read the local language. Um, so that's the, uh, you know, so in Google Maps, like, part of it is like, if you, if it's helpful for you, like you hit that start button, start AR, you hold your phone up, you scan around, you see that first big arrow, that provides value for a lot of folks. And they're like, I get it, I see why this is helpful, I will do this when I feel necessary. And it's because we are not forcing it on the user, the user is choosing to hold their phone up. And, and there has to be enough value for them to do that. And now we hand out. And, and to add to that, Justin, you guys also encourage users to put the phone down after a little bit of time, correct? Phone down. Phone yeah. Down. <laughs> um, so thank you, Justin. Please join me in thanking Justin. Yeah, cool. Hey, good to see you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Liam Trevitt. I, my day job is with NVIDIA, uh, but by night, I'm on the Kronos Group, which is a standards organization. So if we're talking from a slightly different perspective from the last two awesome presentations, we're not talking about a, an application and how the application behaves, but the underlying APIs and standards that things like 6D and some of these applications you've seen would use under the covers. So just one slide on Kronos. If you haven't come across us before, uh, we're uh, one of many different standard organizations in the industry. There are hundreds. Um, everyone has a particular focus. Uh, our focus is developing hardware acceleration APIs, things like 3D graphics, uh, vision processing, machine learning, and we have about 150 companies, everyone from Google all the way down to small single person startup companies coming together to create these open standards that are made available uh, free to the industry. We have, a, we have a bunch, and we're going to have a few minutes tonight, um, so I won't go into all of these, but we have some 3D APIs, like the new generation Vulkan, WebGL in the web is a Kronos API. We have the Compute and Vision APIs, like OpenCL and OpenVX. Uh, in the middle here, we have a couple that I want to talk about uh, today. One is OpenXI, which is a set of APIs for portable uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. And first, uh, GLTF. Stands for uh, GLTF is a GL transmission format. It's a 3D asset format that's been designed to let you very efficiently transmit 3D assets across the web uh, or across, in fact, any network. It came originally from trying to get assets efficiently into WebGL, but then lots of native apps and engines approach and say, hey, we, we want that too, because GLTF fills a very specific place in. A spectrum of different file formats, and there are dozens of 3D file formats out there. But GLTF is the only one that's compact and widely available, easy to process, and describes full modern scenes, uh, animations, textures, physically based materials, very, very high quality uh, graphics. And now it's uh, available uh, pretty well everywhere. This is standard PowerPoint, and this is in the video. This is actually a GLTF uh, model that you can position and animate. Uh, this is just one example. Facebook is using GLTF Microsoft here. This is part of making Windows 10 a full 3D uh, capable system for their uh, HoloLens. And actually, if you begin to look, you'll see that lots of different engines, apps, and tools now are either producing GLTF or ingesting uh, GLTF. So on the left, we have the tools. There's the uh, 3D authoring tools, I'm sure many people here will recognize like Blender and Max and Maya. There are some of the new tools like Adobe beginning to produce 3D assets and they're using GLTF to do that. There's the AR tools, there's scanning tools. On the right, there's all the engines and apps. Uh, lots of the gaming engines now are beginning to ingest uh, GLTF. The web engines like 3GS and Babylon. Uh, lots of the uh, VR and AR apps, Magic Leap, for example, uh, now ingests GLTF as part of their uh, framework. And down at the bottom, you've already seen Office and all the, the, the 3D models, the 3D camera in Facebook is based on GLTF too. But I know you guys are uh, ahead of the curve, so I didn't want to talk too much about what we've done. I want to talk about what we're going to do next. The number one on the list for 
roadmap on GITF is next generation uh, PBR materials, physically based rendering. GLTF2, which is the current uh, version of GLTF that is shipping in all those different engines and apps, does have PBR already. Uh, we have pretty flexible, but I would call basic PBR, um, metallic roughness, and optional specular glossiness. That's something that the industry has come to use. Lots of the engines, Sony and other companies, have really refined the use of those uh, modeling uh, paradigms for goods materials for a number of years. That's why everyone's kind of jumped on board and using it um, uh, easily and quickly. But now people want something better still. They want things like clear coat varnishes. They want to have subtle surface scattering for a realistic skin effects. And uh, how do we define that in a way that can be easily processed and understood uh, by everyone? That's, that's the challenge. That's what we're working on uh, right now. Uh, we're getting lots of input from the industry. Uh, some of the most um, you know, advanced speed companies in the industry, like Dasso, who create lots of the CAD and authoring tools. They've been working on PBR for many years. They've given us lots of contributions. We're working with that. We're working with the Google guys at Filament. We're working with the Babylon guys at Microsoft. Otoy, that's very high-end. Uh, ray trace rendering, NVIDIA has MDL. All these threads are coming together into what we hope will be a good next generation PBL model for uh, GLTF, which will ship as an extension uh, to GLTF2. Number two on the list is, my goodness, wouldn't it be awesome if there was a single texture format that we could send to every device and that device would understand it? Because we're in a weird um, able situation right now where every device has a different GPU from a different vendor and that vendor has chosen to support a different selection of different GPU accelerated texture formats. Which means very often you have to ship multiple versions of the textures in your scene or your object just to make sure that the GPU gets one of the formats it understands. And that, that of course creates a whole bunch of uh, needless download time. So we think we have a solution to this one, we call it uh, Universal Textures. CTTF is the actual acronym, because we love four-letter acronyms. Uh, it stands for Compressed Texture Transmission Format. This will be um, an extension to GLTF, because we already have mesh compression. We've worked with the Draco team from Google. There's some awesome mesh compression technology that's already built into GLTF. So the mesh part of your model is already being compressed if you want to use uh, that extension. Now, textures, which often is the biggest part of an asset, we need to compress that too. Luckily, we, we're fortunate, we have someone who's working actively in the space. Uh, it's called a company called Binomial, it's a small two-person company based in Seattle. Uh, there's some people up there who've been working on video and texture compression for many years. The Crunch compressor, one of you, some of you may have heard of, same people, now they've created the basis universal format. It's a format that you can encode into and the, the encoded assets go down to the size of JPEG, which is pretty small. And then when you hit the GPU, you can transcode it back into a native GPU format of your choice. On the fly, you don't have to uncompress the complete image, you just have to uncompress the bits of the texture that the GPU wants to use and you can very efficiently decompress it into any of the native GPU formats that you find are used on the device that you're running on. So, we think we'll be able to get this out before the end of the year, and it means you'll be able to transmit a CTTF universal asset, and it should be usable on uh, any device. <coughs> so, please give it a shot and give us your feedback. The other, that's a file format. The other thing I wanted to talk about tonight in just a few minutes is open XR. This is a runtime API. Some of you might have heard of this before. By XR, we mean B and A, uh, augmented and virtual reality. Today, the situation is on the left, a classic fragmentation problem that standards love to solve, where we have apps and engines wanting to write to lots of different um, HMDs and runtime platforms, and all those APIs are different uh, because they're all designed in parallel. OpenXR is defining a single API with the cooperation of all of these runtime vendors 
So they can all expose that, that uh, exact same API. Your apps and engines only have to be in once, and then you can run on any hardware. Also, something that's coming in after version one is a device integration layer. Same thing for the device manufacturers. If you're building a, a good hand controller or a haptic chair or something, you can integrate your device into an open XRM time up from, um, from the bottom up. But the first uh, version of OpenXR, which again should be here before the end of the year, uh, is a set of APIs that does everything you need in AR and VR except the rendering. You need a rendering API. So for Vulkan, for example, we use Vulkan because we're Kronos, so you could use DirectX 12 or OpenGL. Um, the rendering is done through your 3D API as normal. OpenXR does all of the sensor processing, life uh, time management of an application, booting up, discovering what sensors you have, mapping it into the inputs you want to use, um, doing all the composition, getting the sensor input in real time, doing the output haptics, um, OpenXR uh, covers all that uh, for you. It also gives parameters to the uh, rendering API so you can uh, dynamically adjust your application for the frame rate, the resolution, uh, eyes, it's a mono display on your phone or stereo display in your HMD. Uh, OpenXR lets you handle all of that in a portable way. So you have uh, kind of a who's who of the AR industry uh, that's supporting OpenXR, which is really its strength. This wouldn't be interesting if all of the hardware wasn't going to support it, but the, the good news is that we do have the good support of the hardware uh, companies. I think the reason is it's a win-win-win. The hardware companies win because once they expose OpenXR, they'll get access to more content. The content developers win because they buy it once and they can run on more hardware. But most importantly, of course, the end users win because now they can invest in their HMD and know they're not going to be locked into a single silo of content to be able to get any content they want. So we're no longer being this VHS versus Betamax standards for competition. Uh, we can get rid of that uncertainty from the, the market and hopefully that everyone will uh, benefit. Some of the most, uh, some of the key people that have made uh, announcements, um, Microsoft, for example, have announced that OpenXR is going to be shipping on HoloLens 2 um, and um, yes, HTC, um, no, Facebook, well HTC has said it's going to be shipping on their hardware, but Facebook has specifically said it's going to run on the Quest, which I know is uh, of interest to a bunch of people. I think it's almost my last slide. The, of course, the, the metaverse is going to be the web. Everything, all these APIs, Falcon and OpenXR, you talked about the native APIs used by native apps and applications. Uh, you need this all to come into the web too. And Kronos has WebGL for 3D rendering. But the good news, of course, that W3C is working on WebXR, which is awesome, uh, along with the engine site 3JS. And uh, we're making sure that we have good close ongoing collaboration between WebXR and OpenXR. We hope OpenXR is going to make WebXR's life uh, ten times easier because they'll only have to write once to the hardware. So Kronos, you know, this is our mission. Uh, we create these low-level uh, APIs. The um, question is, of course, we're here at an AR um, session. So uh, we have really AR kit now core. They're really awesome. That Apple and Google are doing tremendous work. Um, and of course, they're proprietary. Uh, future versions of OpenXR will probably include that kind of functionality, but in a cross vendor portable way. Uh, and you probably see it first on um, devices like HoloLens and Magic Beam. And actually, this is my last slide. Uh, it is an AR cloud, so I was like, okay, how would you use these things in a cloud? One different perspective on cloud AR is 5G. The 5G community that's really latched onto AR saying, hey, oh my goodness, 5G has latency, low latency and high bandwidth we need. We can actually do offload of the 3D rendering from your uh, device into the cloud. Wouldn't that be cool? And it's going to be interesting to see uh, this work. Um, so there's a bunch of people making what we're calling MEC servers, multi-access edge computing. 5G, it's only going to work kind of locally, like a line of sight. Um, but that gives you enough. If we all had AR or VR devices here, you could have a MEC server sitting in the corner 
with a bunch of GPUs, like your little mini cloud, and 5G would actually be low latency enough and high bandwidth enough to take the sensor data from your head mounted displays and feed back the generated imagery from a you know, heavy 2T GPU uh, cluster in your local uh, cloud. And that, that server will be downloading the apps, um, downloading the assets, the 3D assets, the models that you need uh, from the, the big cloud outside there, you know, depending on what applications you want to run uh, locally. How will the standards help? Well, OpenXR, it turns out, you can actually hide the fact that you are not running your rendering locally on a GPU on your head, but running it in some cloud-based uh, server underneath the OpenXR APIs. And the, the pixels coming back, also, you can hide that and to composite those, those pixels into your HMD displays using the standard OpenXR uh, APIs. And of course, you can download your assets on the cloud uh, using GLTF. So I think this is going to kind of come together over the next 12 months or so. And again, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of new use cases uh, it enables. And that's it. Thank you.